Bibles, please, Adam. Second Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 10 to verse 21 of Second Corinthians 5. Now we know that if the earthly, and I'm sorry, from verse 10, yes, yeah, from verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Messiah, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then we know what it is to fear Yahweh, we try to persuade men. What we are is plain to Elohim, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of Elohim, for we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Messiah's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Messiah in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in the Messiah, he is a new creation. And old is gone, the new is come. All this is from Elohim who reconciled us to himself through Messiah and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that Elohim was, was reconciled, was reconciling the world to himself and Messiah, not counting men's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Messiah's ambassadors, as though Elohim were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Messiah's behalf, be reconciled to Elohim. Elohim made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of Elohim. Hallelujah. A little bit of the background of what um, caused the Apostle to pen these words. First, we could consider that he was being challenged as to his Apostleship. He was being challenged as to the validity of his ministry. <clears throat> and I would think that having ministered to people in Corinth and the Corinthians, it could be quite discouraging at this stage for persons to be questioning the authenticity of his call and whether he was indeed selected or ordained by Yahweh for the work that he was doing. And Saul gave a little insight, in my opinion, into some of the things that kept him going and motivated. Because indeed the whole work of Yahweh was a struggle. He had to labor strenuously. He had to endure hardships. And when I say hardships, physical hardships, false brethren, shipwreck, beatings, um, storm at sea and uh, hunger and thirst and persecutions. All these were the kind of things that he endured for the glad tidings sake. And so we must ask the question, what is it that keeps you going, Saul? What is the thing that keeps you motivated? Why don't you just throw your hands and give in? And he gives us in his writings, I believe, there are certain little insights that he, that he shares of what is going on in his heart, in his mind, in his thought process that tends to keep him zealous and motivated for Yahweh. 
Tell me something, saints. Isn't it true that oftentimes we find that we lack motivation? Isn't that so? Oftentimes we find as if the, the zeal is seeped out and there's not as much zeal as there should, not as much enthusiasm as there should for the work of Yahweh. In fact, this was one of the problems in the church in Laodicea, of whom Yeshua says, you're neither hot nor cold. And for this reason, I, I wish you were hot or I wish you were cold. Now, that's a strange thing to say. Why don't you just say, I just want your heart? But you see, if a person is cold, at least you know exactly where you stand. And if you're not, you know exactly where you stand. But when someone is lukewarm, neither here nor there, it's insipid. You're not quite sure whether that person needs encouraging or rebuking or what. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so Saul gives us, should I say, some of the little guidelines, I think, that helps us to understand his own, again, thought process and what helped him to keep moving on. And I'm sure if we consider these things and even apply them to our lives, that we too can help where motivation and continuation and drive and vision and zeal and enthusiasm is concerned. One of the things he mentions was contemplation of the future. He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of the Messiah, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done whether it be good or bad. So Saul had this continuously in the front of his thinking, one day I have to appear. I have to appear before the judgment seat of Messiah. You know something, if we kept that in our mind, shouldn't it temper the way we conduct ourselves? Mm -hmm. To realize that one day we must give an account for what we have done. We must give an account also for what we have not done and should have done or could have done. Whether it is good or it is bad, one day we shall have to answer for every single thing that we have done, appearing before the judgment seat of the Messiah. Now, this, he says in the next verse, he says, knowing therefore the terror or the fear of the master, we persuade men. In other words, he knew that that day could be a dreadful day and it's going to be a fearsome time a time when we shall be judged with the minutest scrutiny and therefore made sure that his every deed matched up and added up and, and his life counted for the kingdom have you ever had been subpoenaed to attend court and you are going either as a defendant or as a witness or as someone who has been prosecuted. Have you ever been to court? Some of you have never been to court so you don't know the whole process. Um, if you are a defendant whereby you have been prosecuted and you have to bring a defense for what you have said and done at a certain time, before you go to court, even then you begin to suffer. You suffer because even though you may know you're innocent, there's just maybe some clever lawyer there who can twist things around and say what you didn't mean and your words can be misinterpreted and you're found guilty and fined and punished in some way 
for some crime you didn't commit. And you don't know with the, the exquisite type of questioning that you may get, some issues may arise that you hope would never arise, and you are compelled to answer questions that you didn't really want to answer. You wish the subject just wouldn't or didn't come up. The whole process of going to court tends to drive people to their knees. <laughs> I'm talking saints, and those who don't believe in going to their knees and then put nutmeg in their mouth uh, <laughs> and anoint themselves with an oil call, we must get away. <laughs> but forget all that. Think of that one day we will stand before a person, not the gentle looking Yeshua of whom the scriptures and the gospel spoke. Not the one that had just that lamb-like appearance only, who said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. But one who is a judge, he says the judgment seat of Messiah, one who speaks imperiously, sternly, not mincing his word. One who John the Revelator saw in the first chapter of Revelation, who when he saw him with his eyes like fire, looking at him, piercing through to the very core of his being, one whose hair was white and glistening, whose garments were long and with a, with a girdle around his waist. And when he spoke, his voice was like many waters. Think that one day you have to stand before such a one and give an account of yourself. Let me say, brethren, should that make us buck up and ship up? And said, boy, when I get to thy court, I want to hear, well done thou good and faithful servant. I don't want to be taken apart by the judge then say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Or be cast into darkness. Or to hear those dreadful words, I never knew you. Who are you? Saul says, knowing these things and contemplating the future judgment, <laughs> helps to keep me motivated. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I think it should be the same for every one of us. Isn't it times we are sorely tempted to stray, to fall into sin? Nobody is watching you. Your brothers and your sisters is not around. You're just on your own and you are tempted to do something. Let me tell you, at that moment, remember, we must all appear before the judgment seat of the Messiah. My Father. Hallelujah. Yes. To give an account of the deeds that we have done. <laughs> deeds done in secret will be shouted from the house top. We cannot have to keep your voice down, keep your voice down, I tell everybody. <laughs> Nothing will be undercover. Nothing will be missed. How important it is that time that we are clothed upon with his righteousness. So we can stand before him and say, I stand before you in the grounds of mercy, trusting in what you have done. I have done your will from my heart. I have pleased you to the best of my ability. I have served you as I ought to have served you. You're sure. You're sure I stand before you. Not afraid and not ashamed, but still I do fear you because you are a just man and you are righteous with one who does not even count his angels as pure, the scripture says, what less more some mortal man.
contemplating these things even now should keep us on the straight and narrow. Shouldn't it? Yes, Do we believe it? Yes, Do we believe that there is a judgment to come? Do we believe there is a judgment to fear? Or do we think things will go on as they've always gone? And that there will be no change. We will live, we will die, and that will be it. Let me tell you something, every one of us, young and old, big and small, will have to speak for ourselves. Hallelujah. Right now, Yeshua is our advocate. He's not just our judge right now. He is our lawyer who is helping us. We have an advocate with the Father, the scripture says, Yeshua the righteous. And when the enemy would accuse us, he's at our right hand says, I have died for such a one that he might be forgiven. Yes. Change his garments. Put on him clean garments and renew him. But that day we will not stand beside us as a lawyer but before us as a judge. Who will be our lawyer on that day? The only lawyer for us will be our deeds. The one that will speak for us then will be the righteous acts that we have committed and our prosecutor will be our own conscience and whatever sin of failures that we have at that time. Knowing these things, we are motivated. Hallelujah. And so all goes on, he says, in verse 13, for whether we be beside ourselves, it is to Yahweh, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Whether we be beside ourselves, is the uh, way whether it means the word beside ourselves suggests that the Corinthians were thinking that Saul was a little bit crazy he was insane because of the way things he was speaking when they were not exactly on his wavelength some of the things he, he spoke sounded strange and out of this world even one of the one of the judges that he stood before, was it Felix or Agrippa? One of them said, Saul, much learning has made you mad. <laughs> you have to say, I am not mad. But he says, listen. I really don't care whether you think I'm insane or whether you think me sane. If we are beside ourselves, that is, if we are insane, if we are fanatical, it is to Yahweh. And if we are sober, if we are sane, it is for your cause. So either way, whether we sane or insane, it's for Yahweh or you. Anyone you want, take you take it. Which caused me to think, that in serving Yahweh sometimes, we're going to look like we are beside ourselves. So people are going to think you are crazy. You are mad. You are fanatical. You have gone overboard. You are too serious. Why can't you be a normal Christian. But no siree. We are not called to be normal Christian. We are just called to be a normal believer. And a normal saint. And let me tell you a normal saint. Makes a normal Christian look very It is not the a nominal Christianity. It is people who will walk by the faith of Yeshua the Messiah. And so Saul did not care if they thought he was mad or he was touched upstairs or he'd gone off the rails. He says, if I'm fanatical, it is to Yahweh. I remember many years ago hearing about a man who used to carry one of those sandwich 
boards over his shoulder. And he had a sign in the front and a sign in the back. And as he was walking down the street, at the front of the board, the sign said, I am a fool for Christ's sake. Oh, we would say a fool for the Messiah's sake. And everybody, when they saw him, started to laugh. <laughs> and as he went past them and they looked, they read what was said at the back on the board. Whose fool are you? <laughs> we are somebody's fool. There are people today who will, with fanatical fervor, will lay down their lives for what they believe, even though we know it is manifestly false. There are those who hold a vain, a, a vain hope that they will be ushered into paradise by the destruction of others. Not knowing that they will stand before the judgment seat and point it towards eternal damnation. They are deceived, yet they are held by a fanaticism. But I want to say, we are most sober. We're not just blazing fire out of control. We are people who know what we're about. We have read the word and reread it. And we know that that which burns within us doesn't turn us into fools. It makes us sensible people. Saul speaking to the young minister Timothy says, Timothy, be sober. And he also says to him, Timothy, He says, listen, the spirit of Yahweh, the anointing, the fire of Yahweh, that which comes from Yahweh makes us of a sound mind. Yet, still we are of a sound mind, but in a world that is upside down, those who are of a sound mind look crazy. That is the fact. And those who are crazy think they are of a sound mind. I recall a couple of years ago, a couple of brethren had an experience. I won't give too many details. They had a, a certain brother that was giving trouble. And they decided to take him to Bellevue to have him admitted as being a little unhinged. And they went through the security at the door, at the gate, to Bellevue with this young man. The intent was to have him stay there to, to get treatment for his mental condition. And um, they went inside and there was a lot of paperwork they had to do for him to be admitted to that institution. While they were talking and getting the paperwork done, the same young man that they brought to be admitted walked back to the gate and said to the security guard, I brought a couple of people come <laughs> to be admitted and they're just getting settled on and they're getting sorted out. So they soon finish and soon get them settled up. Goodbye. And the guard let him out. <laughs> of course, when they came looking for him, those who tried to have him admitted, when they came looking for him and came to the guard, where are God said that the man said that you know it's the man people. <laughs> and he's gone. Persons who are not wholly sound mentally think themselves perfectly alright. It's a fact of life, isn't that so? Saul so says, if you think I am insane, then it's for Yahweh I'm insane. Saints, what can I say to us today? They just been singing for Yahweh. They just been beside ourselves for His cause. You don't 
know, see when people get beside themselves for the cause of this world. You know, see they when they jump on the back of a truck. Yes, and risk their life for hanging off. And make up nice going to meeting and you know, see as you see and people look and say, they are crazy. They risk their life rock and true and they're still gone. Let us be insane for a good cause. Because one day it will be proven who is sane and who is insane. Who is beside themselves. And Saul says, if I'm insane, if I'm beside myself, it's for you. And if I am sober, it's for your cause. In other words, you are getting the benefit. So either way you take it. I'm not a loser. Hallelujah. Praise his name. What is the other thing that kept him motivated? It speaks in verse 14 that he was driven by love. For the love of the Messiah constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all are dead. The love of the Messiah constraineth us. All the love, Messiah's love compels us. Yes. I could also say it impels us. If we don't love Yeshua, how can we serve him as we should? It always boils down to this, doesn't it? In, 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 to the assembly of Ephesus, the angel of the assembly, the message came to that person from Yeshua, the Messiah. You have left your first love. Yes. Some interpretation interpreters put it this way: You don't love me as you used to love me. So it says, the love of Messiah, not only the love in him, but his indwelling love is what compels us to act in this way. It is, a, it is the driving force. It is what gives passion and life and enthusiasm to whatever we are doing, the love of him. And you know, that's why when love grows cold, when inward love grows cold, outward action begins to diminish. It starts on the inside. And this is where it's most important. Saul so says, the things that I endure, the journeys that I make, the hardships that I go through, the gospel that I preach to all those who hear me, Having known abuse and known that when I go up to Jerusalem, I'm going to be bound and I'm possibly put in prison. But the love of Messiah compels me. Yes. There is something inside of me that even though I know all that awaits me, it keeps me going. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Let me tell you something. If there is anything less inside of us than the love of Messiah, it will be manifested. If it is the love of money, if we serve for what we can get, one day it will be revealed. If it's the love of power and we serve because of position or acclaim, one day it will be revealed. But when it is for the love of Messiah, all those things can be taken away and still we are constrained. Still there remains passion and enthusiasm because the source of our life and our zeal comes from the love of Him. What shall separate us from the love? Yahweh, which is to be found in the Messiah, Yeshua. Shall tribulation, shall affliction, shall famine, shall sword, shall nakedness, Things present, things come, death itself. No, no, no. None, none of these things shall be able to separate us Hallelujah. from the love of Messiah. 
Give us grace to love him. Even as he loved us. He so loved us that he gave himself for us. And that's why often we need to pray, Yahweh, please rekindle the fire of love within our hearts. Rekindle the flame. Light it again. That we may burn with a true passion for him. That we serve him. We do his commandments because we love him. We don't serve because we feel that if we if we don't serve bread and grain talk. That's not it. We don't come along because we know say any we we miss them we ask where we there. No, no. We don't serve because we happen to be in town before we are out of town, it's a different story. The love of the Messiah impels us. It's what keeps us going. Hallelujah. And we pray that He will cause us to love Him even more. Which says to me that there is competition going on. Yahweh said in His Word, I'm a jealous Elohim. You know when somebody jealous what can happen? You know what can happen when people are jealous? Hmm? Yes, death can come. I am jealous for you! So we need not fear or wonder whether Yahweh loves us. bonds that he holds us, he says is stronger than death itself. Yes. We know that the Son of Yahweh loves us yes. because he gave himself for us. He paid the supreme sacrifice. The scripture says, brethren, here in his love, not that we love Yahweh, but that he loved us. The measure of love is to the extent that Yahweh gave and the sacrifice that Yeshua made. That love, that pure, unadulterated love, a flame of that light has to touch our hearts. Oh, yes. And to set us alight with the same pure love. But alas, there are many competitors for our spiritual affection. Isn't that true? The things of this world is competing for our affection and for our attention. Trying to woo us away, draw us away from our first love. Isn't that what the enemy does? He comes to offer and try to offer the one who's quite settled in their relationship with Yeshua and he tries to woo them with words, with blandishments, with lyrics, with pleasures, with gold and with silver. What is he trying to do? He's trying to steal the heart. Because he knows if he steals the heart, you can continue to come to church and do everything, but your heart is gone. A person backslides before they leave the church. Yes, sir. Backsliding is not just stop coming to church. We can be sitting in the pew, in the chair, and a backslidden. Yes, sir. It's in the heart. Oh, yes. Yes. We are only here in body. But our spirit is elsewhere. And sooner or later, the body will enjoy the spirit. Only a matter of time. So if we feel the cold finger of death beginning to take our heart away, and we feel ourselves getting cold, that's why the scripture said, stir up the gift that lies within you. Rekindle the fire once again. Hallelujah. Say, read.
breathe on me. Let the breath of Yahweh breathe on me. Hallelujah. The smoking flax he will not quench. No, he will find the flame. For Yahweh doesn't want anybody's fire to go out. Saul said, the love of the Messiah constraineth us. Let me move on. Verse 15. For that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. The words should not live unto themselves. In the life of Saul, self was dethroned. Which, what is our biggest problem? Is it the devil? No, sir. You think it's the devil? No, 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 no. It is not your husband. Sir. Our wife, our children, our neighbor, our friend. Sir. Our biggest enemy. Sir. 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 That the Messiah died for all. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. How does a person live unto themselves? They live unto themselves as if self is the supreme and center of their universe. Everything they do, self is focused. Everything revolves around self. They go to work. Solely for what? Self. They eat and drink solely for what? Self. They buy their clothes really for what? Self. They want self to be pampered, to be looking pretty, self to be nice, self to be exalted. Self, self, self. But let me tell you something. When the love of the Messiah begins to constrain us, Self has to take a back seat. Self has to bow the knee before you're sure the Messiah. Yes. It's not that we don't care for ourselves. It's just that it's not the center of our being. Right. You're sure is the new king upon the throne. Yes. And self is subservient to him. Right. And so we say, that we should no longer live unto ourselves. Let me tell you, a lot of the problems that exist in our society is because people are selfish. All right. They think of nothing more and nobody else but themselves. And in some cases it's worse than others. When people don't think of anybody else but themselves, their manners go. They have no manners. Why? Because self. Who cares? Respect goes. Why? Self is at the center. Violence increase. Why? Self. I was
It is self that makes us so proud, right. so conceited. Mm -hmm. Many an argument mm -hmm. is because we felt slighted, ignored, and not given proper respect that we think <laughs> is our due. Mm -hmm. So we have to let them know, you know, see me, you know, hear me. Saints, to keep motivated, you better put yourself out of the way. Yes, sir. We can choke on ourselves. Too much flesh will kill me. Yes. Children of Israel, they ask for meat. Mm -hmm. When they get it, you came it out of their nostrils. Yes, they didn't overdose. Yeah, we wanted to teach them that man should not live by prayer alone. All right. Self must be dethroned. Yeah. And we must come to a place whereby we know that we are in Yahweh's hands. He will take care of us. Right. When self is dethroned, oftentimes we will take the wrong, even though we're right. Yes. We will take the wrong even though we are right. Sometimes when self is dethroned, we'll stop the argument. Because we know if we go on too much, self going to assert itself. Because self starts off feeling <laughs> puffed up. Then it starts with words. Then when words not getting through, self gets physical. And even if it not gets physical, Self still feel to tongue somebody in their mouth. And even if you not tongue them, it will tongue them good in your heart. Because if you can commit murder in your heart, you can't tongue somebody in your heart. Hmm? I'll get them a good box. Self. Self was beating from. This was one of the things Saul lived no longer unto himself. But he realized now that a new life principle was working within him. He lived to fulfill the will of Yahweh. And coming near the end, he says in verse 16, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known the Messiah after the flesh, Yet now it's what no we no more. The man being the Messiah is a new creation. All things are passed away. The old old things are become new. One of the ability that Saul had was to see beyond the ordinary. He says, from henceforth now we know no man to the flesh. How do we judge people? Do we judge people after the flesh? For instance, take Saul's position. He was called as a preacher of glad tidings, teacher of good things and of the gospel. Surely, when he went into the presence of those who were wealthy, dressed in fine clothes, and who seemed to have it all, dare he look and judge things after the flesh? Or did he realize and say, there is a poor soul. He looks externally like he's got it all together. But in spirit, that man is in poverty. In spirit, he's corrupt. He's on his way to destruction. We don't know man after the flesh. We don't look at people after the flesh. We're not impressed with things after the flesh. Because behind, many times, behind a pleasing countenance can be a breaking heart. Yes. Behind someone that has a smile can be a heartache and grief. Oh, yeah. You don't know what that person is going through. And if you only look up to the flesh, you'll be put off. Maybe you might be feeling impressed. To speak to somebody concerning their soul's condition. You feel impressed in 
using your spirit to offer a word of comfort or help to them, but they look like they don't need anything. They look okay. Don't follow how people look. Don't know people after the flesh. So the evil the Messiah, we don't even know him after the flesh. And from henceforth, no we so, no man. We don't make judgment after the flesh. If we look at people's flesh, we see some who are pretty, beautiful, yet ugly inside when they open their mouth. Your pure profanities come out. Now we know that there's corruption in there. We see some that look strong. Physically, powerfully, yet we know they are yield easily to temptation and they fall quickly. We know no man after the flesh. Because we know no man after the flesh, we are neither impressed with any man's flesh. We are not impressed with any man's position. We are not impressed with what? person has. We are more impressed with the excellence of the earth. Those who have gone through the change and transformation that only black tidings can bring. But we don't make judgment according to what we see with our eyes because let me tell you something. Yahweh doesn't look upon the outward appearance. You look at the little widow woman, little grandma on the earth who's lived her life and is now about to depart and is a poor grandma but poor grandma might be richer than a was. poor grandma might have a powerful spirit within her she knows how to pray she has access to the throne of grace and when she speaks Yahweh hears her prayer who is richer? the one who has the ears of the king of kings and the ruler of rulers Hallelujah. Not the one who has the bottles and beads of this world. Hallelujah. Henceforth we know no man after the we look beyond the order. And it's what keeps us going. We don't make judgment according to what we see. We don't go into a community and say, whoa, what a lovely community. Everybody has a fine home and beautiful lawn and a swimming pool. Yet behind closed doors. Behind closed doors, the worst of crimes is going on. Yes. Right. Worst of things is going on inside that beautiful house. Yes. We don't judge according to what we see with his eyes. Right. Hallelujah. Right. Let me wrap up. Finally. Saul speaks in verse 19 and 20 says, which is what that Yahweh was in the Messiah, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for the Messiah, as though we to beseech you by us. We pray you in the Messiah's sake, be ye reconciled to your Elohim. What is Saul saying here? In a matter of motivation, mm. he's saying our outlook. We are a people with a mission. All right. Yahweh was in the Messiah reconciling the world to himself. That was the heart of Yeshua's mission. Yahweh was in him to reconcile the world. Now we, we have the word, work of an ambassador. For the Messiah, an ambassador is one that represents a foreign power. We are not of this world, though we live in it. We are ambassadors. We represent the kingdom of Yahweh. We are children of the kingdom. And here we are, yet in this world. And we are saying to those who are hostile and who are waging war yeah. against the things of Yahweh and against
against, against righteousness, we are saying, listen, be reconciled unto Yahweh. You can't win this war. You can't defeat this kingdom. Hallelujah. In this kingdom, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not vain, but they're mighty through Elohim to the pulling down of the strongholds of Satan. We come as representatives and we speak in the name of the King of Kings and the Ruler of Rulers. We speak in the name of Yeshua the Messiah and we say to you, turn from your sin and turn to righteousness lest you be destroyed. Hallelujah. Be reconciled. Yeshua when he left this earth he did not leave the earth without a witness. He said, go ye into all the world. Preach this gospel. And as ambassadors, we stand in our world. Hallelujah. So we realize we're not people without a purpose. We have a message. And with that message, we are not backing down. Because we're not speaking of our own accord. But we are relaying the message of our king. And his word will stand. And it shall rise up to judge everyone in the last day. Hallelujah. Bless his name. Saints, let's keep on going. Let's keep running this race with patience, being motivated, with zeal. Hallelujah. He who has begun the good work in us, surely complete it. Praise God. Hallelujah.